In this video, I'm gonna to talk to you all about self-employed home-based mortgage advising, whether it's the best method for you to follow, whether it's one that you should follow, or if there's a different method. But not just that, I'm gonna go on a different tangent as well, because this was from a conversation that I had on a Facebook Live where I was interacting with the audience and answering their comments as we were going through. So there's loads of value in here where I pick up on the conversations and the remarks of others. So there's even more value in this episode for you to get the best from. And also I talk about uh, marketing, lead generation, ways in which you can do it so that you can get more results. Being self-employed is tough. Home-based self-employed mortgage advising is gonna take you a very long time to learn, develop, improve, and grow. So watch this episode to find out how you can get the fast track. Let's get into the episode. Howdy team, following yesterday's episode about gaining CAS, gaining competent advisor status, someone reached out to me and said, is it possible to become a self-employed, home-based mortgage and protection advisor? And I think, personally, I would say no. I think the job is too detailed, I think there's too many components, and I think you need so much support that being home-based straight from the off is just not going to give you the expertise, the support, the guidance that you potentially need. Now, I'd love to know what you think, particularly if you're an experienced advisor, mortgage advisor, will writer, protection advisor, industry expert. Could you, in your experience, have gained CAS? Could you have learned the job, the systems, the research, the sourcing from working from home? Is that even possible to do that efficiently, effectively, to know what cases you're going to be working on. Good morning, Sarah, hope it was good. Let me know what you think. Kerry, let me know what you think. Could you have done this job, working from home, straight from the off? How did you start in the mortgage industry? What was your first experience and what was the training that you got and who did you learn through? Because I think so much new blood coming into the industry, it's vital that they get the right training and support and guidance that is needed to become CAS. And as Mike says there, he did it and it took me too long. That's the thing, is it's often, you know, you can read the books, you can look at the podcasts, you can connect with other people, but they're all slower versions. I talked about this yesterday actually in, in my academy. Yesterday, uh, so I've got my online academy all focused on building your business, six principles that you go through, and that's very much a DIY kind of service. We give you the training, we give you the tools, and you have to then implement and take the action. Next, it's then a case of you know group coaching, where you get together, we get together every other week, and you experience uh, you know some accountability, some support, some overcoming challenges, some questions and some answers, and it's hearing from related to your business, but you hear the ideas of six or seven other people, as well as getting your problems solved, and you've got accountability and support. And then you've got one-to-one -one coaching and mentoring. And one-to-one -one is the ultimate fast track to success, because it's almost like having somebody on your team, i.e. me, who, isn't a you know, who is a business partner, but without taking a share of your business. So all of these things work, but it's depend it's has a different time scale in which you can achieve the result that you want. I think that's the most important thing. If you're training once a day, or if you're training once a week, or if you're in the gym once every fortnight, it's gonna take you longer to get to the result that you want. If you eat 2,000 calories or 1,500 calories and you stick to it, you're gonna lose weight faster on 1,500 than you are on 2,000. And the difficulty with being a mortgage broker, protection advisor, is that fact that if you learn everything from home, how many others has your BDM, business development manager, your RSD, regional sales director, uh, compliance manager got to deal with like you? I believe that the best way into this job is 
through employment or having an office based position for at least 12 months, giving you the opportunity that over 52 weeks of a year, you get the opportunity to work on maybe 150 different scenarios, applications, um, opportunities and the like. I think it's vital that you have the support and the guidance on a day-to-day -day basis to be able to get the result that you want. Now there's some interesting comments coming in here so I'm just going to actually utilise these because yeah so did it took too long started in mortgages services for a local building society Sarah so it's local building society so I imagine building society same as me at the Woolwich training would have been bang on uh, very compliant Sandy banking then IFA then set up and go on my own yep so banking um, great intro to the to the industry Mike I think with the climate change you have to hit the ground running and there's no second chances in getting this right and I assume Mike by saying that you have to hit the ground running you need to hit it with an employed role or a kind of self-employed on employed with a mentor day to day to give you the support around the case review after first conversation review the research that you've done you know would that be what you're meaning I could do agree there is no second chances in this world and particularly with inquiry levels being as they are um, Glenn did it from self-employed from home um, but needed more support um, Kerry, absolutely not. I worked alongside an experienced broker who guided me. Wouldn't have been able to do it without him. Exactly that. You need that mentoring. You need that element of being able to learn how to do the job. You know, you look at someone like an electrician or a plasterer or a roofer or something along those kind of lines. I know it's not the same um, level of expertise, etc. But an electrician could kill themselves. Let's put that in perspective. An electrician could kill themselves. So they have to start as an apprentice, they have to go through, they have to do two or three years worth of training to understand it. Hairdresser, my wife used to train hairdressers when she was working uh, for an award-winning hair salon locally. Um, and she actually is an award-winning hairdresser um, prior to going self-employed. She used to train them all. And you know what it's like, you earn peanuts whilst you're learning, but you end up with a craft that you can utilize for the rest of your life that you can help uh, cut people's hair. It's something that people are always going to need, the same as mortgages and finance and remortgaging. But there's that support, that guidance, that day to day. You could learn how to cut hair on your own, but Christ alive, would you really want to let somebody cut your hair who had never done it before? Vicky, morning. No, when I first qualified, the other advisors in the office I worked were very instrumental in helping me achieve not just CAS, but vital experience and knowledge. And I think that's it. I think actually CAS is just a status. I think it's just a piece of paper, it's just competent advisor status, but much like I spoke about on my uh, episode yesterday, it's you, you know whether you are a competent advisor or not. Experience and knowledge only comes through application of multiple different clients and multiple different scenarios. Residential, remortgage, product transfer, buy to let, HMO, commercial, land development, serviced accommodation, holiday lets if I haven't said them already, employed, self-employed, bonus, overtime, deductions from pay slips, uh, net profit, SA302s, tax computations, um, what else is there? They're, you know, they're all components and pieces to the puzzle, credit reports, deposit amounts, um, CCJs, defaults, mispayments, adverse credit, IVAs, these are all things that unless you face them all, how could you possibly be deemed competent? And yet there are companies out there that give you competent advisor status um, after you've done just eight mortgages. Well, competent advisor status, status, I believe, to a network is being able to effectively follow the recipe with the ingredients that you have. But if you've had the same ingredients, and followed the recipe and you can tick the right boxes, that doesn't mean you're a competent advisor because if I give you a different recipe, i.e. a different scenario, a different set of criteria, a different set of research, a different client, a different income, a different mortgage amount, how can you be deemed competent at that on the first time that you're challenging it? Um, Steve's done, Stephen Morris has done a lot of training with advisors and depends on the requirement of the company uh, cash status, working at home on your own, as a first time broker is a bad idea. Stephen, I'm completely with you in that, my friend. Um, I spoke about yesterday the, uh, the companies with cash status. 
you know, some of them have six to eight file checks, mortgage and protection, and then you're deemed competent. I've actually heard of one particular company, as I mentioned yesterday, who have signed people off having only done, you know, three or four files and given advice three or four times. It's the advice that's being given that's relative to the client's circumstances, making sure that their objectives meet the end goal that's been recommended. You can only do that through experience. Um, Glenn, good morning, my friend. Uh, I joined a brokerage for six months with best intentions to stay. They gave me no support and promised leads. I left and started again on my own and learned from grassroots. Best decision I made five years and eight months later. Yeah, I think that's a real, you know, the, the, you, the good thing is though, is you had an in for six months. As I said yesterday, I think 12 months is good. It depends how many cases you do over that six months. But, you know, 26 weeks, if you've done a couple of cases a week, you've got 52 cases under your belt, maybe you've spoken to more clients, you could potentially be doing, you know, five conversations a week if you did one lead every single day. What's that, 26 times by five, uh, 52, 104, 120, 130 roughly, you know, inquiries, speaking to people, getting an understanding. You can get a good footing and a good understanding of that. Um, and you're growing a good, successful brokerage, so it really does work. Uh, new advisor experience and helpful advisors around them I agree with you, Stephen, without a doubt. And it's also, as I said yesterday, I think the vital thing around gaining competent advisor status is that ability to have the support around the research. My brain just doesn't remember the criteria now. And I don't think it does for anybody at the particular time, as in today's mortgage world, because it's changing on a daily basis. But let's go back 12 months when I was giving advice uh, more regularly, or, or actually, when I was doing research on lenders and interest rates, that's the difference. I still give people advice, but I don't do the lender and interest rate specifics. That's why I have my team. So um, I, 12 months ago, just didn't, I can't retain the information. The thing that I remember most is self-employed, business owners, limited company directors, sole traders. It's why I wrote the book. I understand how to present it to a lender. Even now, I know how to make a scenario look logical to an underwriter. That's really my skill set. Um, but getting into the detail of the type of clients that we deal with now, it's just not my bag in that sense, which is why I have all the advisors that I do. Uh, maybe you are the same. It's all about superpowers, as I've spoken about many, many times. And mine is definitely bringing new clients in. Michelle, I went straight into self-employment from home. It's bloody hard, but I've learned so much fending for myself. So you went straight, in, straight into self-employment from home. So Michelle, that's really interesting. So did you have a mentor? Um, how many cases did it take you until you felt competent? How much contact did you have with possible mentor or coach during that period of time? What would be your advice to anybody considering employment from home right now? Would you advise them to do it? And what would you say would be the key components that somebody would need? I would love to know the answers to those questions because I very much followed the route of Woolwich, Connells, Alexander Hall, um, a brokerage in Colchester, um, and then running a brokerage for somebody else for 12 months and building that to 100,000 a month as sales and compliance manager, managing a team of 13 um, advisors, that was. Um, and then we had back office staff and everything that was managed by Emma, the, uh, the lady on the other side, and then Pete, who was the owner of the business. Um, so I've had such an experience before I went self-employed that I'm not, no, you're gonna be better to answer this question than potentially I am. I think from my experience, I don't think it's possible. I think you really, really struggle if you want to be a self-employed home-based advisor and you want to do it properly. I've got a couple of people under my team who are self-employed home-based advisors. However, Andrew has daily conversations with them. We have a WhatsApp group. We've got five other advisors that are constantly supporting them. I was speaking to one of them yesterday about various bits um, and particularly around some of the cases that we deal with, we support massively uh, in that ability. Um, absolutely, mentor in 12 months in an office. Yep, Mike agrees. Um, Glenn, I was in banking for 12 years previous to that, bank manager for eight years, so spot on. Um, just done the other broker role. Yeah, so that's the same. So I get your I get your ethos, Glenn, without a shadow of a doubt. I've got Andrew, who's on my team, who was Halifax manager for 12 years. He's now my operations manager um, and deals with the day-to-day -day mostly. He's on two weeks worth of kind of holiday because he's got his girls this couple of weeks. 
Um, but yeah, that has such a big footfall without a shadow of a doubt into that. Um, Steve Pierce, I went from a plaster into protection advice and what a switch and learning curve. And I think that's a good thing though, Steve, because I think more often than not, the big mistake that so many mortgage and protection advisors make when first starting out is trying to do everything at once. And again, as I spoke about yesterday, I took on a trainee in October 2008 and for the first, sorry, October 2018. And for the first three to um, six months, realistically, definitely the first three months and rarely in the first, in the second, in the first, middle in the second three months, i.e. six months of the job, didn't do any protection, just purely focused on remortgages and product transfers for three months, then new leads for three months. I did all the protection advice. Um, and I think a great way into this industry is very much looking at being an administrator so you understand the back office and understand the requirements of lenders, then going into GI, selling home insurance, then going into protection because that's 60% of your income, but it's also the one thing that gets forgotten if you're a new advisor and you're focusing purely on the mortgage and then going into mortgages. I think it's a great career path for anyone wanting to go through the motions and get to that point in time. Uh, and I think it's a great way in which to maximize and leverage your income as well. Stuart was an estate agency based, then IFA back into an estate agency, then went alone. Uh, everyone needs a mentor from the start. Totally agree with that. Um, we've seen a few bad care cups over lockdown. <laughs> Not mine, I hope. My wife's cut mine, Sandy, for the whole time of lockdown. Um, Dean tried cutting his hair. Uh, Michelle. I did, do it for I did do it 13 years ago on an employed basis though. Ah, uh, there you go, so it was not cold turkey. So you had an element of being into the industry with some employment. Um, same Gary, Katie was an underwriter and a lender auditor for years. Uh, it was all about presentation of the application. Katie, and that's the thing, presentation of the application is actually great content that you should put out. Um, I've been thinking the same thing myself because when you understand that element of it, it really stands you out from other people. Um, I've got another one of my mentees who's on my group coaching, um, who used to be an underwriter, and we mapped out for him a whole spectrum of content that he can do around his superpowers of dealing with specialist cases and knowing how to place them and how to underwrite them. So I think that's vital. Um, what else have we got here? Rachel went self-employed straight from maternity after 12 months, and it's the best thing I ever did. So you went self-employed straight from maternity, Rachel. Now I would say, did you have any prior experience in, well my question is, did you have any prior experience in mortgages? Had you ever done any mortgages previously? Um, and you know, what support and guidance did you have in order to gain CAS? Uh, were you a mortgage or protection advisor prior to being self-employed? Uh, and could we work anything from there? Uh, just very interested in that. Um, left corporate, 20 years in banking, no experience in mortgages, just left lockdown, just before lockdown to self-employed home-based, have a mentor, crazy, crazy time. So Emma's doing that. So Emma, how much support does your mentor give you? How often do you speak to your mentor? And what, you know, how, what, at what stages are they giving you support in the research? Because, or in, in the application side? Because I think you need to get the research as early as possible in the process. You need to have somebody listening to your first conversations with clients to make sure that actually you're getting the engagement and you're getting the support that you need and that you're saying the right things at the right time because everything hangs on that first five to 30 minute conversation that you have with a client around your ability to understand their circumstances, know that you can help them, pitch a fee if you're gonna charge one, uh, and talk about everything that's gonna happen throughout the whole process so that they feel completely assured that you're the right person to look after them. Then it's about, have you filled the fact find correctly? And that should be checked before you do your research. Then you need your research checked, then you need your quote sent out, then you need your decision in principle checked. All of those things are what we do before they get submitted to lenders as a means to make sure that everything is correct from the off. That's the degree and I think it is far better to have more support initially, which is why it's such hard work taking on trainee advisors um, because I want them to be the best that you can possibly be. And it's impossible to do that unless you have the right support and guidance and someone on your side consistently, which is a full-time job. Um, so let's have a little look. Oh, my notes have gone. Um, 
Michelle, I'm not cast as cash yet, but we signed off in September. I had a mentor, but they were based circa 150 miles away from me, so busy to assist as much as I wanted. I have an ACM and my network have experts who assist with non-vanilla, but a lot of hours time spent researching, checking the broker chat, BDMs. Like I said, really, really hard, but it's one of the reasons I started looking um, to you and your content. Thanks, Michelle. Um, and definitely, it's a, uh, it is a tough one. Um, there is so much to learn and definitely you're doing all the right things as well from what you're saying there. It makes a uh, makes it key to have the support and the guidance and that's why the Mortgage Pro community really exists. Um, that's why the newly qualified and aspiring community now exists because what started is just to connect with other mortgage brokers in the Mortgage Pro community. Uh, you know, that's now 1500. Well, you've got people who are new right the way through to years and years and years and years worth of experience but you don't get that element of extra support. And most of the support is needed around research and placing cases. That's the hardest part of the job. But there's also the extra support that's needed from just a daily boost up and a daily be happy and um, remember that it's not all, not every case is an absolute freaking nightmare and not every client is an absolute freaking nightmare. Um, Dean started in the bank. I did a work as well with the Woolwich. Um, for going self employed so Michelle I would say it's not for the faint hearted to do what I did as I had no client bank and has been a different industry for the last 13 years I think if you're completely new to the industry then yes you need to be in an office with others doing it listening watching learning the process prior to going it alone and that's a great point there actually Michelle I think one of the reasons why Elliot my trainee who was with me for 12 months was able to write 145 grand from a dead cold start doing product transfers and remortgages for his first three months, generating some, dealing with some new leads for the second three months, and then doing mortgage and protection for only six months, and he still wrote 145 grand. One, I was giving him leads. He never generated a single lead the whole time he was with me. But two, he was able to listen to me doing strategy calls and conversations, and was able to model and put some of the terminologies and the statements into his own, um, uh, conversations which has a bigger impact you know it's much easier to listen to others and have conversations and get immediate feedback after you've had those discussions with clients because that's where the business can be won or lost the research and all the hard work that goes on behind the scenes you know when you think about mortgage brokering as a job you might spend an hour maybe an hour and a half maybe two hours in some instances on the phone to a client but behind the scenes, you're doing 14 to 20 hours of work, depending on the complexity of the case. And that's the bit they don't see. And that's the bit that they're paying for. And that's the bit that, you know, answering your phone on a Sunday night, a bank and other brokers aren't going to do that. Um, being constantly on, I messaged one of my clients this morning at 6 a.m. because he's with a new advisor who's new to the team. I know he's been put with him. And I just want to say, hey, mate, how's it going with said advisor? Just because I wanted to check in and make sure that, you know, he's getting the expectation and the understanding that he needs. It's a commercial deal. I've got a commercial broker, new to the team. And it's just about, you're not going to get that from uh, a large corporate or anything else. So yeah, I think definitely, uh, we, I totally agree with you in there, Michelle. It's listening, it's the overhearing, it's seeing other people. That's probably one of the biggest things that I benefited from um, being part of Alexander Hall. Uh, you know, going from Woolwich to Connells where it was just me in the branches and my manager would come in occasionally, but you're only offering, you know, generally a few lenders products, um, to then going into Alexander Hall where there's six people on my team, a manager at the top of the table, and then two teams either side of me as six, making friends, talking about deals. You learn so much through that environment as well. Um, Rachel, 12 months trainee with an advisor and estate agent, then 10 months on my own. Uh, Katie had no client bank in September last year dig deep so yeah i think it's, it's definitely interesting seeing um all the different scenarios here and i think oh so akshay good morning uh, quick question being an experienced mortgage and insurance consultant for two and a half years and going it to self-employed from the start of october congratulations big step to do it what would your tips be to hit the ground running and ensuring clients are flowing in what lead generations tools would you use uh, content to put out on social media and at the same time focus uh, my superpowers as like to call it yeah without a doubt 
So marketing is my biggest bag. That's what I spend most of my time doing now, actually. Um, I have my academy, the Pro Academy, where I teach mortgage, uh, mortgage and protection advisors, financial services professionals, will writers, IFAs, how to generate leads, clients, sales, um, and profit and time. Uh, and the main things that I focus on are organic social media, so posting one to three times every single day, uh, doing a video at least once a week, uh, utilizing local Facebook groups as a means to connect with local audience in and around you, or being in Facebook groups where your ideal client is hanging out and um, giving value. You know, if you give value three times, then that gives you the opportunity to ask for a pitch four times, playing the long game rather than the short game. Uh, in the academy this month, we're working on building lead magnets, which enables you to get inquiries for under uh, two pound generally, depending on your audience and how you decipher it, you can get them for under four pounds. Uh, we're gonna be teaching webinars and how to run webinars, running quiz funnels, so you can actually get your clients filling in quizzes uh, and engaging with you that way. Um, and there's so many different ways, networking. Go back and listen to uh, my lives on, I think it was Monday and Tuesday, where I went into detail all around marketing. Uh, so have a listen to those. Make sure you go and listen to my Financial Pro podcast because I've done loads of episodes on there all based on lead generation. Uh, Hemel as well. Uh, I am going to be releasing a marketing course off of the back of my book that I've written. Um, so I'm looking to finalise that and get that released by the end of this year. The book is going to be all focused on mortgage advice, uh, lead generation for financial services. Um, and there's gonna be a course off of the back of that as well to put it all into action. All of my academy members will tell you the results that you can get from what I teach. Video, blogging, uh, Instagram, location. Social media is super, super powerful. LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, uh, Twitter, uh, website. There are so many different methods that you can utilize all with different timescales and different results, but you've got to understand what you do and don't want to do. And I think in order for you to control your profit, uh, you need to control your marketing. From 2009 till 2015, I, uh, well, when I first, the brokerage that I built for somebody else in 2005, uh, I was generating, we were buying leads. It was at the time when Money Supermarket released. And building that brokerage up to a hundred thousand pound for somebody else who spent all day in the cinema pretty much. I then went self-employed with two and a half grand for my dad, bought leads for 15 pound per lead. By the time I got to 2015, I was spending 20,000 pound a month on lead generation, um, paying for low quality, um, poor answering leads, which I find is one of the biggest issues with all of the lead providers that are out there. They're a business. They'll sell you leads two or three times, you'll be in mass competition, you'll get rate tarts who don't wanna pay you a fee, and you'll end up, if you buy 10 leads, you'll end up only speaking to five of them. Um, don't ask me why, but they just, it always happens. You need at least 100 in order to be able to um, get a good sample as to whether it's a good lead source or not. And, you know, if it's costing you 50 pound per lead, oh my God, that is huge. Um, the Academy package, um, we go through a cycle it's not just focused around lead generation because there's many components that enable you to do that. It's like the Netflix of building your business. So over July, we went through vision and actually setting a vision for your business. This month is all about marketing. Um, next month is all about process. Then it's about sales. Then it's about people. Then it's about business at the end of the year. And then we set a new guide for the next six months thereafter. Um, We've got probably 70 hours worth of content and training uh, in and around how to market, how to generate leads, how to systemize, how to structure, how to save time, how to be more efficient, how to improve yourself from a personal development point of view because your business can only grow as much as you grow. Uh, we've 169 members in the academy, I think. Um, and all you need to do if you wanna see it is just go to um, www.financialpro-academy.com uh, and that's got all the information on there for you. Uh, it's £147 per month. Uh, you get accountability, you get support, you get guidance and when you look at the cost, it's an investment and I guarantee you that you will get back more than what you pay over the course of a year from the leads that you will generate. 
all my members have. I've got people who have been with me since March, since August now. We did our secondary launch March last year, March 2019 was when we launched with 20 members. Uh, eight of them are still with me. Majority of people who joined in August. The big thing to understand that I tell everybody now is you need to allocate time in your diary. I've always allocated since going self-employed one to three hours in my day for lead generation, uh, for marketing, for business development, for looking at learning, developing, improving, testing, reviewing, tweaking, uh, improving processes, looking at numbers, strategizing, seeing where I've missed on protection sales and can potentially upsell. That time is part of your daily ritual of academy learning. Um, you know, you should be looking to take at least one week out of one day every week out of your business to work on the business. Uh, and it's all about action and implementation. We give you the education, the inspiration, the tools, the tips, the strategies, the tactics. But if you do nothing with them, then you don't get the result. Um, in the last 12 months, my brokerage has gone from um, three advisors, uh, sorry, three on the team, me, my PA, and my marketing person, now to 11 on the team. Um, we've just got rid of a couple of advisors, uh, so we did have 13, we're now 11. We're getting them rocking, we're gonna be taking on another couple of PAs, and then we'll look to grow thereafter, but we've got, we're gonna be a million pound just on the current setup with the extra couple of administrators that we will be getting in future. So everything that I teach is from the growth and the success that I have with my own brokerage. Um, and the foundational principle that is there is always more to learn and the biggest area in the training portal is marketing without a shadow of a doubt. Because if you can generate more leads, you can create more sales. If you create more sales, you create more profit. If you create more profit, you can reinvest into people and staff and then you can um, create more time because that's what you want. It's so easy to lose a lot of time within your business. Um, so sorry, I went on for a complete tangent there and that wasn't the intention of this this morning. Um, but I hope actually if that answers your question, financialpro-academy.com. Um, I recently passed CMAP in July and have observed not many brokers with advisors with outcasts. What platform would you recommend for beginners? What platform in what um, to manner? What do you mean? What platform for what? I recently passed CMAP in July and I've observed not many brokers want advisors without CAS. What platform would you recommend for beginners? I'm not sure what you mean, what platform. Um, Eamon, good morning. There was, is a company I'm looking at, but 40 pound per, 40 pound a lead. I guess if the leads are good, then the ROI will be good, um, but it's a gamble too. 100% Eamon, I'm, I'm not a big fan of buying leads. Many of my mentees, don't really do it. They now focus on their own marketing strategies because they realize that if you, for you to get a good idea as to whether 40 pound a lead is gonna work for you, you need to buy 100. Have you got four grand? Off of the back of spending your four grand, you should at least to expect to make 16 out of the leads that you buy. When I was spending 20 grand a month on buying leads, my whole purpose and goal with any marketing cost is to get four times ROI. Um, and if I'm not generating four times ROI, then I need to have a look at them and see where I can. Bare minimum would be three times ROI. Um, but that's how you look at it. Some people look at how many leads you're converting, things like that. I don't really care about how many leads I'm converting because it's gotta be about monetary return, not about lead conversion. Can keep you busy, but at the end of the day, if you can spend four grand and get 16 grand back, hey presto, happy days, that's a good business model when you take into account all the other costs and the time involved. Um, I'd love to hear more from the packaging from an underwriter perspective and how you tell about a story. Um, Michelle, never paid for a lead, just get on social media, get yourself out there constantly. Yep, totally agree with you, Michelle. I stopped buying leads in 2015 when I downsized from my insurance brokerage from 13 to three, um, and that was 13 as a whole team. Started all over again. My best PA, my um, marketing consultant, and I started again January 2016, and I was generating, using social media, started producing video around about June time. In April of 2016, I was getting roughly four leads a month, uh, possibly seven. Um, now we've generated over 160 leads in August with virtually no marketing spend. Um, it's all been organic, it's all from being ever present on social media, in Facebook groups, public speaking, the whole lot. 
Uh, B and I definitely work, Sandy. I know some people who who do it. I don't like that net method of networking. I find it's the same people showing up every single week. I would rather spend that money on going to a variety of different events and learning something and connecting with people um, and building my network that way. And if I'm in a room with 50 people, add 50 people to my social media whilst I'm there and make some cool friends. Um, so I hope this helps you and inspires you. I hope this gives you some thought processes around if you're self-employed. We've gone off on a variety of tangents to finish off, so I will just summarize for anyone who has missed the beginning. Um, if you are self-employed, or if you're thinking about going self-employed, and you are thinking about being home-based as a means to learn mortgage and protection, if you're going to do it, you need daily contact with a mentor. You need daily support with research and placing cases. You need someone who is willing to do that for at least 12 months. You also need the ability to be able to listen to other people on phone conversations so that you can observe and take notes because in that observation you will learn more than just trying to thumb your way through everything yourself. I believe the perfect way to start is in an employed role or in a self-employed role in an office where you can listen to somebody uh, and overhear the conversations and ask questions and have your conversations listened to and get the consistent feedback. That's how you improve, that's how you grow. If you look at personal training, and I think business and fitness have got so much in common, if you look at personal training and going to the gym, if you've never been in a gym before and you try and learn everything off of YouTube, watching videos, um, it will work to a degree, but it's not gonna work like having a personal trainer with you for six months who watches how you lift the weight, who makes sure that you engage the muscles, who makes sure that if you're doing chest press, you're not using too much shoulders, who makes sure that when you're doing deadlifts, you engage the glutes, i.e. your bum cheeks. You know, you, can, you don't get told this stuff. Um, and it's exactly the same in the mortgage world. You don't know what you don't know, and therefore, it will take you years, you're learning through trial and error, and learning through trial and error takes you a hell of a lot longer. That's why everything that I do from a training and a coaching and a mentoring perspective, I've developed over the last 17 years. I've got a great team around me that are from Barclays Compliance, Halifax 12 years, um, Simon in the industry for 20 years, Paul in the industry for 30 years, uh, you know, I've also got mentees as well who have been in the industry for a very long time. I'm constantly learning and that enables me to share that information with others as well because my whole ethos is around teaching you the business side of things because it's once you know how to be a good broker, once you gain your own version in your own mind of competent advisor status and you feel confident in your ability, it's then about how you structure what you do, how you do it, to give you more leads, more sales, more profit, and more time, so that you can do more of what you love with who you love, because that's the bit that is so easily dropped um, when, you, you know, when you don't understand business. You can spend hours learning how to be a mortgage advisor and protection advisor, IFA, but how many hours do you spend learning business? Completely, completely different. So, hope you th thank you for tuning in. Thanks for being with me for this very long time. Um, I hope you have a fantastic Friday. I hope you're not too hot. And remember, now's the time to become pro.